how ill-prepared for the army worm invasion they are, the mitigation measures on how to curtail the spread of this army worm are not in place. The farmers have no training. They have no protocols for getting out there. There's no delivery mechanisms. There's no warehousing of anything. And they don't have internally any types of these uh, insecticides to be able to get this army worm. ADAPT 2030 Mini Ice Age Conversations covers changes in our climate due to a new and intensifying grand solar minimum. In the media, overlooking, downplaying, or burying cold weather changes occurring on our planet. This is in order to keep the global warming agenda steaming full speed ahead. I do this podcast and radio program because we need to begin conversations on how to adapt our food growing strategies long before 2030 as agricultural zones shift affecting global crop output but very few mainstream media outlets are talking about the most important issue of our time cold weather crop losses our sun is going through a 400 year cycle which has effects on our weather patterns as our magnetosphere weakens and the jet streams go out of flow it's not co2 it's not you It's the sun. Are you ready to thrive in the grand solar minimum? Then join me for many Ice Age conversations. I'm your host, David Dubine. In the beginning of the introduction, it says mainstream media is not covering the crop losses. (laughs) Well, they are now because they're so gargantuan, so far reaching so far beyond anything ever expected that could be expected, especially this early with our forecasts, oh, we are going so down, crashing into a wall at 1,000 miles an hour. What's happening this year is three years ahead of our forecasts of where we thought we would be in 2021 to 2022. It's happening now. So absolutely, we are into a more powerful, heavier, overriding cycle in the multi-millennia Forget the 400 year, way beyond that. We are going into something in the 2,000, 4,000, or 6,000 year repeat. Which one of those is undecided yet? We still need a few more years of data to understand where we are going. But according to and what we're seeing with the African rainfall patterns, it's a four to 6,000 year cycle we're repeating. Today's program, I think, could possibly be the most important program I have done since the beginning of coming here on Revolution Radio Studio A, freedomslips.com, ever. That's how important I think today's program is about the food crop losses globally. I want to go into when, where, and how much your food's going to rise. By December, everything you buy in the supermarket will be at least 50 to 70% more expensive, and anything that has a corn-based product in it is going to double or more in price, period. And I'm going to leave this statement there. I have been ridiculed, thrown under the bus, asked to be deplatformed, much like Steven Crowder, just because of my beliefs of this sun affecting our climate, not CO2. The censorship I've experienced since the beginning of my channel, Adapt 2030, off the hook. Now everything's coming to roost. The naysayers are actually swinging back in going, David, I'm sorry I misjudged you. Your information was more correct. What are you saying now? So when we come over to what they're doing with Crowder across the the Internet and other voices that are saying, hey, this is my opinion. This is my take on the world around us. Just because it doesn't coteau 100 percent to somebody else's belief system doesn't mean it's incorrect. What if they're the incorrect ones and they're trying to deplatform you and get you off the net? And why is all this culminating right now at this very same time? We're going into massive food shortages on this planet. We're going into massive food price rises on this planet right now. And now they're into this massive deplatforming again of voices that have anything to say that doesn't go with media matters and the whole leftist ideologies of the bring in the communism. The only thing that communism would be good for and socialism would be to round people up in camps because then there would be more food for other people still living. And the only way you would not get round, rounded up into a camp is if you believed with the socialists and could toad to them. And if you did and you got followers, you would then be a threat inside the party and you would be right in that same camp. And speaking of cycles, my new book with my co-author Bill Porter, Climate Revolution, a must read for understanding our sun driven climate. As we progress deeper into this new Eddie Grand Solar Minimum, 
Weather extremes leading to global food scarcity and higher food prices are here now. This book describes the expected changes, how to survive and thrive during future challenging times, and also practical preparations. The entire book is interactive with over 250 links. You can click and go out to the scientific aspect of what we're talking about with the repeating cycles in this grand solar minimum. The science is explained so you understand the mechanisms. The solutions are there because we know we're going to face these exact same problems again that were faced in the Maunder Minimum, the Spore Minimum, the Wolf Minimum. Find designs for building greenhouses, grow guides, beam soil techniques, as well as bioreactors to create your own growth hormones for the soil. Available now, the new ADAPT 2030 Climate Revolution. The link's in the description box below. So why is this all culminating right now? Because I want to start with the food crop losses and what I talked about last week. What has happened in the last week in terms of knowledge and getting a foot on the ground assessment of what's going on. Plus, I wanted to start to bring in all these other countries that are periphery corn producers that the corporate media is not putting two and two together, perhaps on purpose. But they are definitely now talking about crop losses in the mainstream media. They have to. It is so all encompassing. I tell you what, if you're listening to this broadcast, you are absolutely going to see something that you thought was not possible unfold in front of your eyes on this planet. Let's start with the United States. So I'm going to go through the countries that are losing corn production right now and what the corporate media is not talking about versus what is being talked about. Now you can find this same information On the corn forecast I did on the ADAPT 2030 channel, I did a December 2019 corn price forecast. Now, this corn price forecast also includes the losses, but in this last week, in this last four days, I've had an enormous amount of new information come to me about China. So let's put it into perspective first. United States is the largest producer of corn on the planet, hands down. Who's number two? Trivia question. China. If you didn't know that, China is number two. So between the United States and China, they make up 60% of all the global corn production. Over half, 60%. So what's happening in the United States, as you've seen, now here's where we get into where the corporate media is drawing in the gray line to suck you into the gray line so you're not looking over into the very clear where we're heading to, they're bringing you into the gray zone. What does I mean by that? Well, out looking at the current time, we have to follow the media step up in the last, let's go back a month. Now remember, they were assuring you that even though these floods were here, the late planting was still gonna get in the ground and there was only six million acres that weren't gonna be planted. And that was up from three million in April. And then they told you it was only six million acres that won't be planted. Don't worry, it won't affect your prices very much. Just go back to work and pay your taxes, turn on the game and just chill out and have another beer. And then suddenly that has rolled up to 31 million acres of unplanted. Yeah, that's right, 31 million acres, over five times what they told us a month ago that wouldn't be planted, actually three weeks ago, it's now not being planted. You know, I have an enormous amount of people writing telling me that in the conditions in the state, some places are having a great yield. Some places are like chest high already, correct. Some other places are already showing some growth that's normal. But the amount of non-planted fields and what the USDA calls scrappy emergence is shocking. Now they're moving that figure up to 35 million acres of non-plant. Now, the farmers are trying to decide, will they take the insurance for the no-plant dates and roll through that? Will they try to even continue after to plant? Because the University of Illinois did a really good study. So each day after May 30th that you plant or a farmer would plant, it reduces the yield by 1.1 bushels for every single day that the planting is over May 30th. Now, the average yield last year was 170 This year, I think we're going to go sub 160 for sure. If it's anything like this and they're still trying to plant and it's the 7th of June, we're already eight days past. That knocks 10 bushels right off there. So it's at least 160, anybody that gets it in the ground now. 
And again, the the terms that the USDA, that's the United States Department of Agriculture that does the field assessments and the crop tours and give you an indication of what's coming out, what they're expecting for the full production for the year. When they come out and say scrappy emergence because of planting in poor soils, either too cold, too wet. See, so here's where they get into the gray area. What they got planted in the fields that counts as planted acreage. What they're going to get out at the end of the year is going to be completely different than their forecasts are. Completely different. I have some farmers writing me in and go, we're going to be lucky if we get 120 bushels coming out. So I'm thinking, all right, how do we average all this? We saw the extremely late planting everywhere. And we saw these massive floods down in Arkansas right now. Although Arkansas is not a major corn producer, but they do an enormous amount of rice. Flooded rice, flooded soya. That's in Arkansas. You have to see the Arkansas River floods. They are massive. I have been sent some photos of before and after, and I really am shocked. I've seen an enormous amount of uh, images of floods. You know, I look, I scour the internet for this kind of stuff to do my videos. But these Arkansas floods are something different. The river is a regular river. You know, there's a bridge across it. We're used to seeing rivers that are decent size in America, except for the Mississippi. That's super huge. Your average pretty big size river, Ohio River, Arkansas River, whatever it is, something normal, big Tennessee River, Southeast U.S., Missouri River. That thing is normally in its banks. But what I have seen is helicopter photos where as far as you can see off of a helicopter, it is water. And we saw the same things in Nebraska, Iowa. The planting in the United States is the worst ever. I've, I did a whole bunch of crunch figures, and I, I encourage you to watch the video. I'm not trying to go out there and promote myself too much and be like, hey, go to my video, go to my video. No, but this time, really, go to the video. Everything I talk about is in numerical values with the charts broken down so you can see it. It's on the ADAPT 2030 channel, and it's called the December 2019 Corn Price Forecast. I hope you can afford your food. The numbers that were given during and showing currently are the lowest ever, ever in the United States planted. And this goes back to 1938. Put that in perspective for a second. They planted more acres in 1938 than we are planting this year. 15 million less acres being planted this year than in 1938. How many people were on the planet in 1938? This number is set to rise as well. That's the whole thing is the conjecture of where we're going due to the farmers trying to decide what they're going to plant so late and the crop insurance programs and the plant by dates already expired and everybody's way into twilight zone now. 35 million is what they're looking at, and it could stretch up to 36 and a half, 36.7, maybe 37 million acres not planted. OK, so this already had a gargantuan price rise on the on the futures market. If you're looking at the options futures market, it went from like 360 up to uh, 440. Now, historically, if we look back in the past with the massive floods in 1994 and then also the massive floods in 2011, we saw the same thing happen. There was an initial jump up, it pulled back, and then it skyrocketed more than doubling. But here's the wild card. Now, when that happened in 1993 and 2011, all the other corn producers across the planet were still at pretty good yields. I mean, comparatively, they were having great yields. And the only country that was really heavily affected was America at that time. Everybody else was picking up the slack, if you will. Let's go back again. I'm going to call these years. 19, you got to look at the charts, which I also included in the video. 1993 to 1997. And then actually the floods occurred in 94. And we saw the, the run up in the double bump there up to 97. So that three year period, there was like a two year lag time before massive price increase. Again, 2011 floods is rolling through 2013. So we got this two year interval of when the floods occurred and then when the prices really spiked. Like it's the exact same thing. The prices aren't hitting at the moment. They're up a lot, but the real price rises haven't even hit and priced into the market yet at all. Not even close. I was calling with my price forecast seven dollars and thirty five cents corn, seven thirty five. It's at four forty or drop back down to four thirty four somewhere at four thirty five at the moment. I'm calling a full three dollars above that. Now, why did I talk about that? Because 
This time around, the other periphery corn producers that would help pick up the slack with uh, America, this is the scariest thing. And this is the part of the program I want to go into. And really, I hope you don't sleep tonight thinking about this. Your lives are about to be tremendously affected. And not only that, I wanted to talk about the censorship, too. Why is it suddenly that they want to curtail the flow of information? Now, why is this? It couldn't be coincidental timing when we're getting into the all-time highest prices for food ever recorded on our planet coming up here. Well, except for the 1600s in Europe, circa 1730, the prices rose 7x, 7x. That was for barley, though, and that was throughout Europe. And the prices were up and down during the modern minimum as well. China. Let's talk about China for a second. Second largest producer in the world. They usually are producing somewhere around 10.5 billion bushels-ish. Some good years, like 10.7. They are having the most massive, I mean incredible, movie invasion of the army worms into their corn. Now, this invasion of the army worms started in Myanmar, according to the news reports. And the vector spread of this army worm is off the hook. Off the hook. They're reporting 20 to 50% losses already. And this is the Chinese media, by the way. So get this. This is the Chinese media coming out giving you these numbers. So if the Chinese media is coming out telling you we lost 20% of our, of our corn down in Guizhou already, and it's just the beginning of the summer grow season, Chinese are not so forthcoming with their information. So 20% for me means 50% somewhere else. And for them to straight out come out and say 50% on the border regions in Kunming, around that area in, in Yunnan province with the border area with uh, Myanmar. So that means Myanmar corn production completely wiped out. And another thing that's in the news that's not making the news, which should make the news, which is the scariest thing, is they have no insecticides for this army worm that's have been approved that are in the market that farmers can buy to spray the crops to kill those army worms. They have nothing. And this was one whole report was about how ill-prepared for the army worm invasion they are. The mitigation measures on how to curtail the spread of this army worm are not in place. The farmers have no training. They have no protocols for getting out there. There's no delivery mechanisms. There's no warehousing of anything. And they don't have internally any types of these uh, insecticides to be able to get this army worm. TrueLeafMarket.com. I really want to talk about growing your own food, which will be a necessity moving forward. Now, there's so many ways that we can go about growing different types of vegetables that we're going to need. You know, microgreens are incredibly nutritious. They're super fast to grow. In less than a week, you can have something that you can eat. Also, sprouts. We can get those a little bit taller, a little more dense, a little bit larger volume on the vegetation mass coming off of there. So how do you know what kind of sprouts to grow? How about wheatgrass or herbs? What about different types of herbs that we can add to our foods? Now, what I just described to you, there's a full range of starter guides there at trueleafmarket.com for you to take a look at. Even if it's just for your own knowledge and you don't purchase something from them, at least get the information so you know how to grow microgreens, you know how to grow sprouts, you understand what some of the herbs are for. TrueLeafMarket.com. Use the link below and give yourself the gift of organic and heirloom seeds. Secondly, it is an off strain of what the traditional army worm would be. So even the pesticides that are developed that we have, let's say in the United States or Europe, whatever, they're not exactly working that well in the test plots that they have. Something has changed in the army worm enough to where it's sort of resistant. I'm not going to say resistant. But there's a larger percentage in the population of a whole that's resistant to what we have currently on the planet in terms of pesticides for this particular type of army worm. They're finding that the, uh, they called it like the live-through rate, hadn't heard that before, versus the attrition rate when, when they killed off, is higher than normal. China's just going into its growth season, if you will. Plus, they're being hampered by drought. Northern China, Central China, and then a little further, when you come from Central, let's say Shanghai, and you draw a line across the country, and if you come south of that, and just before you get to Hong Kong, you get that central region of China, they had massive floods like America did. So 
the country's kind of there's this razor thin line above the line. They're getting huge drought, very difficult planting conditions up in Heilongjiang. That is the border area with North Korea, which is also having a massive drought going. We get down into central. They had huge floods during the planting season. Again, much like America, muddy fields, delayed planting, planting in wet soils. No, 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 no. Goes on. Then we come down right to the border periphery areas. We're going to call it out west where Sichuan province is and then Yunnan province, that whole area. That is the vector start point from that dropped over from the Myanmar border with the army worm invasion. And oh my, you should see how fast it is spreading. It's uncontrollable. It's out of control and they have no mitigation measures there in place at all to even stop this thing. And then they're in this trade war with America. So the pesticides coming out of the United States that could go to help this are not coming. And then we have Junhun, which is the agricultural ministry spokesperson. Here, let me get out the article here while I, while I continue to yap on. They were saying that because of the trade war with you bad Americans, we are the farmers here, I'll read you the headline. It comes off Zero Hedge. Anyway, this one, good one. Beijing warns U.S. farmers may lose Chinese market for good. His name was Han Jun, vice minister of agriculture and rural affairs. Give him the correct title there. It says American farmers are risk losing the entire Chinese market in the deepening trade war. I'm going to call BS right now. Fei Hua, which means you're wasting your words. Lang Fei. Wasting the words because, A, they need America desperately. And this is where it gets into the twilight zone. China's the second largest corn producer on the planet. They made up for what America lost in the massive floods in 94 and 2011. This year, China itself needs a lifeboat. They're going to lose between 20 and 50 percent of their crop totally, which is going to take them from like 10 and a half billion bushels down to between like uh, six to seven and a half billion bushels. They themselves are not going to have enough corn to run inside their own factories for their own internal consumption. China is going to be scavenging this planet looking for imports, period. China is so far behind the eight ball right now that it's scary because it scares me that they don't have enough to supply the rest of the world because they were the ones who made it up. And America's down heavy and China's going down heavy. And then let's look over in Europe. Europe should save us, right? Remember, Europe's another huge producer on the planet, the EU zone. But I have to bring you over here to the watchers first to explain why I bring up the EU next. Now, the watchers news, the Adarelli watchers news, they cover all the uh, really intense weather uh, wipeouts of things on the planet. It's the best way. It's like a extreme weather consolidator site. One of the best on the net, by the way. If you are admin or somebody associated with the watchers, thank you for what you do. It takes so many hours to collate what I do for videos, but for them to put together just this primo, cream of the crop news feed of just the most extreme weather events on the planet takes a lot of time, too. So what we're looking at here is Romania flooding in half the counties in Romania, Bosnia, Herzegovina and Bulgaria. So then I thought, how much corn production is there in Romania? And I look over on the map of the European corn production averages Romania produces 13% of all the corn in the EU. And then all the periphery countries as well. So what's this? More flooding, wiping out more corn crop in Europe? So the European corn crop's going to be down. France experiencing heavier than wet conditions as well. Their corn crop was already in dire straits back months ago. They were talking about how poor it's going to be because of such wet conditions. So France producing 21% of the corn in the EU, Romania producing 13%, and both of those places are in declining output of corn just because of the floods. So now we have another tick on the box there. All right, that's another set of countries that's not going to be coming in. They're going to be looking for increased imports as well. And then we're going to jump over to Electroverse, and they have this new article up here called Severe drought is leading to an East African food crisis. The famine early warning systems network is already active. South Africa is offline due to the politics, pretty much. Zimbabwe 
still struggling along asking for the World Food Organization and the World Health Organization to give them food assistance because they can't grow enough. And then they wonder why their food production declined. Huh. I wonder why. When Mugabe confiscated all the land, their agricultural production went to pretty much zero. It has never come back. They had all these training programs because I'm really reading about Zimbabwe and South Africa right now to see what's going to happen in South Africa because it's following like lockstep, step for step, what happened in Zimbabwe. So I'm really reading, trying to read the agricultural history of Zimbabwe as of late to see what happened. We're taking all the land back. Awesome. They didn't train anybody to go farm the land after they took it all. Everybody's out there cheering. Yeah, yeah, we got the land back. But nobody knows how to farm it. Oh, we went into a famine, too. Oh, that's crazy. Hyperinflation. Oh, a huge number of people left because they were going to starve to death. So they left. Imagine that. But down in South Africa, at least the farmers were training their workers. And they were a major, major exporter to the rest of Africa. Wheat and corn. Well, that's going down, too. Now, you got to realize if the East African area, say Ethiopia and going down into Kenya, Tanzania, they were also corn growers. So if they can't grow because they're going into a massive drought, by the way, that matches a 3000 year pattern for rainfall. While the northern part of Africa gets super soaking wet or the middle part of eastern Africa drying out. Why? Because the whole moisture band shifted. That's the whole thing with this grand solar minimum and the reason the weather's so out of kilter right now. Entire bands across the planet of moisture shifting into new places. So a new moisture band moves into a place that's already kind of wet and those systems collide. And that's why you're getting these massive, massive rivers from the sky. You got double, triple, quadruple the amount of moisture overlapping in the atmosphere. It's got to come out. So some areas are going to get super dry like this one here is going to go into a mega drought. So is South Africa. So is Australia. Again, Australia is now a net importer of wheat. If you didn't get the memo on this over the last month, Australia has lost pretty much 90% of its wheat production to the point now where they are importing wheat into Australia to satiate internal demand. Now, I haven't dug into the corn production figures out of uh, Australia, which I'm going to do later today. I'm trying to get a full report out for the weekend. So where does that leave you in terms of understanding where the climate is shifting and how your food's being affected? Australia is now a net importer. They used to export wheat by millions of tons. They used to export like 8 million tons a year export. Now they're down to nothing almost where they're importing. South Africa used to be a major exporter to the rest of Africa. They are now a net importer of corn and wheat because they can't even grow enough to satiate their own internal demand. This video is brought to you by our friends at trueleafmarket.com. Heirloom and organic seeds for any grow zone on our planet 